Okay, this is video two for March 18th, sorry, March 19th, Thursday, for AP Euro. Just finishing up the Armenian Genocide. So next, uh, we're looking at the Arab Revolt against the Turks, um, we, which we already briefly mentioned. So although Arabs and Turks were Muslim, the Arabs regarded the Turks as oppressors. They had been controlled by the Ottoman Empire for centuries and wanted their own independence. As the Ottoman Empire was weakening during the war, Arab tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, now Saudi Arabia, organized attacks on Ottoman posts. The British supported these revolts and supplied them with weapons and advisors uh, to try to break off and become free. So basically the British were undermining the Ottomans to make them weaker as an, uh, as an ally of the Germans and the Austrians. Most famously you have Colonel T.E. Lawrence, who you see a picture of right here, or Lawrence of Arabia who helped advise and help lead their attacks against the Ottomans, um, very famously portrayed in Lawrence of Arabia in the movie. Uh, Emir Fasil of Arabia drove the Ottomans from cities of Mecca and Medina as well. So you see him right here, Emir Fasil of Arabia, also helped drive the Ottoman Turks from cities of Mecca and Medina, which are Muslim holy, holy cities. Syria and Lebanon also overthrew the Ottomans as well. So Syria and Lebanon inspired by the Arabs, also through the Ottomans as well. Which is why when the war ends, it's basically just Turkey. Turkey, the Ottoman Empire ceased to exist, and just, it's just Turkey after the war ends. Uh, after the war, Great Britain betrayed earlier promises to support Arab nationalism, and the Arabs failed to establish independent states. Um, what you're going to see take place is basically uh, the British and the French will establish these uh, almost kind of like colonies, like a protectorate situation where they're going to run these territories into the nineteen um, into the nineteen forties with World War II. It's called the Mandate System, which we can come back and talk about that in a second. Anyway, so they they did not support Arabian independence and betrayed them, and so uh, Arabia remains under foreign control for a little while longer. Okay, Japanese aggression in the Pacific. Uh, Japan declared war on Germany in 1914. Japan then seized many of Germany's island territories in South Pacific and territory in mainland China. So Japan declared war on Germany in 1914. Japan then seized many of Germany's island territories in the South Pacific and territorial mainland China. In 1916, Russia helped Japan extend its reach into Manchuria, which they'll later try to take over the rest of that in the 1930s. Um, so in 1916, Russia helped Japan extend its reach into Manchuria, which is part of China which is also right out of Korea, which they had already taken over. Japan att uh, attended the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, but didn't gain any new territory. Anti-Japanese sentiment forced the Japanese out of China. So anti-Japanese sentiment forced the Japanese out of China. Those frustrations of Japan's territorial ambitions being denied fuel their desire for an empire. So they're not really satisfied, and they're going to come back and try to expand again into Manchuria, into in what is China, in the 1930s, which we'll come back to that later on down the road for World War II. Okay, the balance of power shifts. The balance of power shifts. After World War I, the balance of power shifted. The U.S. emerged as a world leader as a result of having to industrialize and help fight the war. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire disbanded. Um, several of their, of their well, countries split off from there, like Austria became its own country, Hungary became its own country, but other, other groups they had once controlled broke off, became their own countries as well, too. I'll show you a map of this in a second. So Austria-Hungary disbanded and split into several small countries. Under the mandate system, which was kind of like this colonial administrative system in the, uh, the Middle East, it was authorized by the peace treaty. So the peace treaties they, signed, they developed in 1919 will authorize this mandate system in the Middle East. Victor nations took over Middle Eastern territories. America does not, but it's mainly, it's mainly British and French territory. You can see it right here in this map um, where it says British Mandate of Mesopotamia, which is like Iraq, and then British Mandate of Palestine, which will eventually be Israel. Then you have French Mandate of Syria here. So you see that a lot of these territories are being taken over by the Europeans. Um, yeah. So they also acquired Germany's colonies in Africa in the Pacific. So Germany's uh, previous colonies fell under uh, French or British control. French and British control the regions of Palestine and Syria as well, which explains the reason why later on they're able to make Palestine into Israel because Palestine was not independent at this point, so they, could make, they can help convert it into Israel in the 1940s. 
Britain, France, Belgium, and Australia govern German, Germany's former possessions in Africa. So all of their former German um, colonies got divvied up between these four powers, and they were governed by those powers instead, not given independence. Uh, the, the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire led to the creation of the modern state of Turkey under the leadership of Kemal Ataturk. And that's a very popular or famous guy to be aware of, Kemal Ataturk, A-T-A. T U R K. Uh, he takes over 1923, and he makes it a secular independent state. So he does make them into a secular independent state in the 1920s. So that's Turkey. All right, we're gonna go a little bit more. Here's a picture of Africa. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is uh, the League of Nations and how it governs Africa after World War One. You can see that Germany lost all its territory as a result, and how they ended up. Controlling it, the mandate systems, all the ones in checkered areas, which is former uh, German te territories. So now we're going to look at the peace element very briefly, and then we'll be done. Okay. Uh, so the peace conference uh, will convene for World War One in Paris in January of 1919. The war ended in November once the Kaiser of Germany advocated, and uh, they went to armistice. But they had to work about six months on a peace treaty. So the peace conference met in Paris in January of 1919, a few months after the armistice was developed. The Big Four met there. You can see pictures of them on, on my screen. The Big Four met there in uh, Paris from the U.S., Britain, France, and Italy. Um, the people involved, and I'll go through them real quick. You don't have to really know these names directly. Just be aware of who they are. Victoria Orlando, who's the leader of Italy. Uh, closer. That's David Lloyd George right there, who's the Prime Minister of Britain. President Georges Clemenceau of France, and then Woodrow Wilson for America on the very end. They were known as the Big Four. They wanted to establish long-term peace in Europe and beyond, so this was especially one of Woodrow Wilson's main goals was to make this the war to end all wars and try to develop a long-lasting peace and prevent future wars from ever happening again, which is why he pushed things like the 14 points. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, during the middle of the war, gave his very famous speech called the 14-point speech. It was a very idealistic vision for post-war Europe and how countries would interact in the future, creating peace and security in Europe and around the world. In many ways, um, Wilson was trying to de deliver this idea of a peace without victory. He was trying to end the war where there was no real winner, but you would achieve peace without victory. He had no desire for humiliation, resentment, and revenge and tried to avoid that as much as he could, although that's not the case for the British and the French. Um, so he's really going to try to push as much as he can, but he realizes he won't have much luck with these other powers. Um, you probably mentioned this last year too, but it's also worth noting that it's very unusual to not have, uh, the people who lost there. Like the Russians aren't invited to come. The Germans aren't invited to come. Um, it's, they're going to have people show up whenever it's time to sign, but it's very unusual to have the losers not be involved in the treaty making process to have their ideas expressed. Anyway, so um, the stunning ravages of war put the leaders of Britain and France, George Clemenceau of France and David Lloyd George of Britain, in a much less charitable frame of mind towards Germany. They insisted Germany accept the guilt for starting the war and pay heavy reparations, or, or basically paying money for the damages caused during the war. Uh, so they wanted reparations paid to the victorious nations. They hoped to cripple Germany's ability to wage war ever again, which is what's going to lead to the Treaty of Versailles. So over the next six months, they're going to help develop the Treaty of Versailles, and that's where we're going to stop for today. Uh, Y'all have a good day. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.